Women of all descriptions have faced down and overcome all manner of impediment to become integral to this enterprise, including the barriers in thought and action they allowed to stand too long and those they created or perpetuated themselves. Through their example, their collective and personal effort, their performance, their breakthroughs, and the changes their presence and engagement have brought, women have proved essential to this vital, imperiled profession and to the never finished effort to keep making it better. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining this American Inspiration event presented by American Ancestors, the Boston Public Library, and GBH Forum Network. I'm Margaret Talkett, Director of Literary Programs at American Ancestors and a producer of the series. All of us behind the scenes are delighted you're with us in the land of America's history in celebration of Women's History Month. Tonight, we're looking at the professional work and progress of women in an industry that touches all of us daily, journalism and the media. We're shining a light on the careers and the impact of female journalists since the 19th century in America. Now for some background on our guest tonight. Brooke Kroger is a professor emerita at New York University, where she taught for more than 20 years and was the founding director of the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. She was UN correspondent for Newsday, deputy metropolitan editor at New York Newsday, and for more than a decade before that, she was a correspondent editor and bureau and division chief for United Press International in the U.S. and abroad. Professor Kroger serves on the editorial board of American Journalism, a journal of media history. Undaunted is her sixth book. She joins us tonight from New York City. Now, for information on tonight's moderator, we welcome my counterpart at the BPL. Kristen, over to you. Thank you, Margaret, and welcome, everyone. On behalf of the Boston Public Library, I'm Kristen Motti from the BPL, as Margaret said, and we're delighted to be here tonight in observance of Women's History Month. We're grateful to be able to present tonight's talk in partnership with our neighborhood collaborators at the New England Historic Genealogical Society and the GBH Forum Network. We have two special guests this evening, and I have the honor of introducing tonight's moderator, Dr. Tracy Luke. Dr. Tracy Luke is an associate professor of the Greenlee, at the Greenlee School of Journalism and Communication at Iowa State University. She holds a PhD from the University of Maryland and has worked at USA Today, the Washington Post, and the Des Moines Register. She has written extensively on the history of women in the US media and serves as president of the American Journalism Historians Association. Before we meet both of our guest speakers this evening, I believe that Brooke would like to first introduce herself through the trailer for Undaunted. Although men have dominated American journalism since mass media dawned, the women who work in its most competitive bastions have been a potent force in shaping its history and its present. Undaunted tells their story, decade by decade, in a representative way. It examines how women journalists, against all odds, found ways to thrive at the top of this vital field, in places and positions where they have yet to find easy welcome. Undaunted examines the experiences of the best remembered and the long forgotten. It begins with Margaret Fuller's improbable rise in the 1840s and the high-earning star reporters of the mid-19th century. It traces the breakthrough investigative triumphs of Nellie Bly, Ida Tarbell, and Ida B. Wells. It showcases the standout careers of women who covered major news stories in every conflict at home and abroad since before the Civil War. It looks closely at those who succeeded and stumbled in top newsroom jobs. Undaunted also chronicles the collective fight for equity, from the gentle stirrings of the late 1800s through the legal suits of the 1970s to the Me Too uprising and today's racial and gender disparities. 
as a byproduct, it contains plenty of still sound career advice along with some cautionary tales. Undaunted is about American women who ignored every impediment put in their way to do journalism's most valued work, with emphasis on the huge and singular impact exceptional women have had on journalism and journalism's impact on them. Undaunted, How Women Changed American Journalism by Brooke Kroger from A.A. A. Knopf, 2023. Good evening, everyone. And I first want to say thank you to Margaret and Kristen and Frederick and the Andrews and Tracy uh, for being, uh, for inviting me and for uh, making me a part of this wonderful program. I'm going to start and I'm going to go pretty quickly because there's lots of ground to cover. Answering the question that I'm asked most often, which is, however, did you do such a book? However, did you put it together? However, did you decide who the subjects would be given so many options? How did you decide who to leave out, et cetera? So the way I began, was with databases, maybe 15 or 20 of them of various sorts, a lot of them proprietary. And I used two words, women and journalism, and I applied them decade by decade. Now this was hardly scientific, but it did create consistency. And it created a way for me to answer the 12 questions I had decided were most important in figuring out how to tell the story of the women who competed directly with men. So this isn't a story about all the women in journalism. It's about those who were at the very top of the field. A crude way to say it is they were doing jobs that men would envy. That, that's a way to think about them, which of course, until we get to the 1990s or even beyond, uh, was really quite something. So here are the 12 questions. Which stories best illustrate what women were up against in their professional lives? How or why did the most successful women first get in the door? Because for a very long time, that was not easy at all. Who were the true trailblazers and pioneers? This is something we can talk about a little later. I have big thoughts about that. Assuming talent and hard work, which are a given, how did background, privilege, strategy, charisma, style, looks, advocacy, connections, or luck figure in their ascent. You'll see that we think networking is quite important. How well did ma women manage their successes and their failures, their celebrity and their censure? Were they womanly or manly in their reporting and writing or in their editorial vision when they became in charge? What impact did they have on the nation's news diet, on the profession, whom among them, and this was a really important one for me, has the wider journalism community chosen to honor? And when I say the wider community, I'm mostly talking about men for a great part of this period. What qualities and characteristics fairly or unfairly attributed to women brought condemnation, which brought respect? This is very important in the transition from women only being confined to women's sphere and then moving beyond it. We can talk about that. How did newsroom politics figure? And then at bottom, have women made a difference? The strategizing starts early. We see it in Cornelia Walter, the Boston Evening Transcript. Her brother, Lind, dies. She'd been helping him. She just steps into his role as editor and takes his salary, which is important. Women until the 1880s earned commensurately with men. There was no distinction until we get to the 1880s. Then we look at someone like Margaret Fuller, uh, who was, I think, a master networker. She was someone who achieved everything in journalism any woman then or today would want to, and this is in the 1840s. She wanted to know Ralph Waldo Emerson, he was totally disinterested in knowing her. She was considered off-putting in her style, arrogant, too interested in gossip, uh, though she was extraordinarily well-educated by her father who had tutored her and was brilliant. And finally, she gets an invitation from Lydian, Ralph Waldo Emerson's wife, who invites her to spend a fortnight at their home. And during that period, she gains his friendship, his confidence, and a friendship that was lifelong. When he forms the dial, 
She wasn't his first choice, but who does he ask to be the editor? Margaret Fuller. And this is how she gets her start. She had been giving conversations in Boston, which uh, many of you may know, that were her idea of how to teach women to systematize knowledge. Women at this time, unlike Margaret, who of course had a magnificent education, but were going mostly to charm school. Women's academies were for that purpose. So teaching women to systematize knowledge became very, very important. And she did this through her conversations. One of her greatest fans was Mary Greeley, the wife of Horace Greeley, who of course was the editor of the New York Tribune, the largest paper in the country. Mary convinces Horace not only to make Margaret the literary editor of the New York Tribune, which means she runs a column next to his in the paper on the front page, not only that, but she invites Margaret to live with them. So these are strategies that are getting formed in the 1840s that get repeated. Um, another really important figure of this period and also a New Englander is Lydia Maria Child. And she, uh, of course, is from Medford. Uh, Margaret is from uh, also the Boston area. And, uh, and some people say Mariah, I know that, but uh, Knopf insisted on Maria in the audio book, so I'm going with Maria. She, um, she is writing a long time to make a living. Her husband is just not very good with money. And uh, they, she forms Ch Children's Missionary, which is the first book, uh, juvenile book, that uh, magazine that in the country and makes money at that for quite a while. They, they create the Massachusetts Journal, a paper that does not last. David, and, and her work over these years is women's work. It's practical advice about girls, about food, about you know, household economy. And she has a big reputation of being this kind of a writer. David gets invited to become the editor of the anti-slavery standard. He turns it down, but Lydia takes the job. So this is where we first see the abolition papers becoming a strategy for women to work their way out of the women's sphere. And Lydia does a credible job for a number of years, though the owners and the um, proprietors really want a more vociferous voice than hers, so she leaves under some cloud. But this sets her up on the abolition journey. She writes a very important manifesto on the importance of equity for the Americans called Africans. And this causes her to be virtually blacklisted by everyone who has supported her as a writer over the years. That lasts almost a decade. And then she fixes her reputation at the anti-slavery standard, where of course she's gained credibility with the abolitionists and writes a lot of these New York columns that become very popular. And that's how she reestablishes re herself. Uh, moving on to the next slide, we'll see what happens in the 1850s and 60s. This is the group that comes after. We find some very standout women, Grace Greenwood, whose uh, real name is um, Sarah Jane Clark Lippincott. She's from Pompeii, New York, moves to Pennsylvania. She also does a children's magazine. She gets her start uh, writing for the National Era, which is another great abolition paper. Of course, it's the one that published Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, the most read book after the Bible in the 19th century. <laughs> so that's the big claim to fame. But a lesser known claim to fame is Grace Greenwood and Gail Hamilton. Gail Hamilton's real name is Mary Abigail Dodge. She was the seventh child of a family from Hamilton, Mass, and went as Gail Hamilton uh, for her pen name. Both of these women, starting with Bailey, living in his home, being part of his circle in the way that uh, Lydia had, uh, sorry, that Margaret Fuller had been in the Greeley circle in New York, uh, make their, their way by writing for the abolition press. Why do women get opportunity in the abolition press? Well, of course, because they don't pay anything. So they're looking for good writers. They're willing to overlook gender uh, which, of course, wasn't happening necessarily at other publications. 
but everyone is reading these publications. All the big editors are reading them. So that creates opportunity for these two women who are very, very talented. Grace Greenwood starts writing for the New York Times and other New York papers. Gail Hamilton becomes a regular presence at the Atlantic Monthly. Another great figure of this period is uh, Mary Clemmer. Mary Clemmer is from, she's originally from Utica, but the family moves to Westfield, uh, Massachusetts, Springfield area. One of her poems is published when she's at the Westfield Academy in the Springfield Republican. Samuel Bowles was the editor. So they knew each other. And she goes on to, um, she has a very unhappy marriage that she was pretty much forced into quite young. The husband, Daniel Ames, was a minister. They are living in the Maryland Heights of Virginia when the Battle of Harper's Ferry breaks out right out her kitchen window. She reports this, writes an extraordinary story. Of course, it does not run real time cabled like the major reporters' stories do, but it runs two weeks later and it's published first in the New York Post and then all over the country. You can see the Battle of Harper's Ferry as a woman saw it. And that's the first time I see that trope, which becomes a very, very important one taking the women's angle on things, this becomes a way in for women in the same way that there are other ways in that will develop over the coming decades. Um, she gets hired by The Independent and the Brooklyn Union um, by Henry Bowen, who's the publisher. He is paying her $5,000 a year. She was considered the highest paid reporter in the 1860s and 1870s. She, she was definitely a phenomenon writing from Washington. And yet she had this clinging to some very old ideas about what women could and could not do. Like she would say, women can do anything in journalism, uh -uh, but not crime, you know, not torture, not, not anything that she thought was unseemly for women. She was very disdainful of the women reporters in Washington who were walking around with pencils in their ears. I mean, she had a lot of ideas like that, which you see in Jenny June and other figures of that period where you get that push pull of, yes, let's go forward. Yes, women can do anything, oh, but not quite anything. Clinging to those ideas of home, family, and the importance of these things, not having them stand in the way. So they help, these women help, and yet they also hurt. I also want to mention Marianne Shad Carey, who's a terrific figure. She was from an important Black abolition family in the Pennsylvania area, originally uh, born in Delaware. When the Fugitive Slave Act happens in 1850, she migrates to Canada with, of course, many, many others. And while there, she creates uh, with partners the Provincial Freeman, which was a really important abolition journal. She continues this until the Civil War when she comes back to work on equity for uh, Black soldiers. She enrolls in law school at Howard and becomes, I think, the first woman graduate uh, and really had a remarkable career. She was considered really brilliant. Um, and then we move on to the 1880s. And here's a really great group of women in the 1870s and 1880s and moving into the 1890s. Um, I want to mention Mitty Morgan, sometimes called Mighty Morgan. No one's really clear because we don't have audio to tell us which it is. Uh, she worked for the New York Times. How did she get there? She was an Irish woman who uh, was part of a um, a group that, uh, I mean, sorry, a family that was landed, but her brother inherited in the traditional way. She and her sister were left virtually penniless. They go to Rome for two years on a lark. She's a brilliant agriculturalist and livestock expert. She becomes friendly with King Victor Emmanuel. He engages her to go back to Ireland and buy horses for him, which she brings back to Italy. Through these connections, she has very good letters of introduction to New York, deciding she's going to have a newspaper career. And she's, at this point, not young. And she first tries the world and doesn't get very far. And then she tries another paper 
and they sent her to Saratoga Springs to cover the races. Uh, the legend is she did better than the regular race reporter and wrote an important story, which uh, I do cite in the book. And then she gets a job at the Times because the Times needs a livestock reporter. And so she becomes this phenomenal livestock reporter over decades. And of course, she's this very interesting character. You can see her face uh, always walking around in this raincoat and rubber boots and things like that. And write some important exposés of mistreatment of animals, of uh, things happening to our food supply way before Upton Sinclair. So she's really a major figure and was often profiled because people really were fascinated by what she was doing. Now, did this create opportunity for women? Well, not many women were ready to follow her into the livestock yards, so no, but she was a paragon of possibility. And then of course, uh, I wanna mention Suzette LaFleche in Omaha, who uh, uh, married uh, Thomas Tibbet, who was one of the editors, she was uh, from the Omaha tribe of Nebraska and did extraordinary coverage of uh, the problems at Pine Ridge, really remarkable. And they were re re reprinted everywhere across the country. I mean, in just dozens and dozens of papers. So, you know, she had place in a way that I noticed. And then of course, we've got to talk about the two Idas and Nellie Bly who were, were um, really at the forefront of the creation of investigative reporting as an important critical journalistic force. And it was interesting to me that they're all not so far apart in age, as you can see, and yet I could find nothing, nor did any of their other biographers be able to tell me of any connection among the three of them, which I thought was interesting. There's one note where Ida Tarbell is writing about the prospects for women in journalism. And <clears throat> she makes a comment that a woman should spend her patrimony studying political economy, that this is really important, that you are really educated. And I think this was a bit of a slam at Nellie Bly, who basically had a ninth grade education, if that. Um, and she's saying that you'll never get satisfaction in the field unless you've really prepared to do the work. And this would certainly be true of both Ida's. Ida B. Wells, as we know, uh, owned her own paper in partnership with two others. She goes to New York on vacation. She'd already done some pretty interesting investigations um, into lynching also, but also into other, uh, other abuses that were happening to uh, women on trains, things such as that. She's in New York. They burn her presses. They ransack her office. And it's in New York uh, for the New York age that she writes her major manifesto really on, um, on lynching across America, which really, really establishes her. And of course you can see that uh, the age also published it as a pamphlet. Um, these were remarkable women. Uh, let's move on. Um, I, I paid attention as I said to impact. So, Dorothy Thompson, we can't ignore. Uh, people remember her because she's the one who called out Hitler and got herself thrown out of Berlin. She was one of the first women to have a big European job uh, as you know, a manager of, of Europe for uh, a Philadelphia paper. But then Helen Rogers Reed picks her out and makes her a columnist and that changes her life. She's someone, and you know, this would come through those decade by decade searches that in 1939, both the Saturday Evening Post, which was about as middle brow as you could get, and, um, and the New Yorker run profiles of her, but they're not one issue profiles, they are two issue profiles. So you have to ask yourself, who could get a two issue profile in two major magazines in the same year, and who was also a woman in the 1930s? So she became important in my book. And then I looked, of course, at the Pulitzer Prizes. I did elaborate lists of every year to see how many women were named either individually or in groups. The prizes are founded in 1917. Anne O'Hare McCormick of the New York Times, who was the first person to spot uh, Mussolini, she like spotted him in a, a 
parliamentary meeting and and recognized that something amazing and remarkable was going to happen with him. And of course, it happened within a year. She is a stringer for the New York Times for 14 years, 14 years. Adolf Ox will not have a woman being a correspondent who's full time at the newspaper. He dies and his son-in-law, Arthur Hayes Salzberger, takes over. Anne O'Hare McCormick, like all the women I've talked about before, is a great cultivator. She is friends with the Salzburgers. She is friends with Iphigene. She is also brilliant at her work and has been really mistreated for 14 years. He immediately makes her a columnist. He gives her a place on the editorial board, the first woman. And the very next year, she wins the Pulitzer Prize. That is 20 years after the founding of the prize, the first woman journalist. Of course, there had been women who'd won for poetry or plays or, or such as that, but first woman journalist to win. And then I noticed in doing the work that the Times did not make much of this. And so that got me wondering, why on earth was that since this was news? I mean, Times are elsewhere. It would have been news. Anyway, that's a big scoop in the book, and I'll leave it to you to find out what happened there. Uh, it's kind of surprising and not surprising. Then we don't get another prize till 1951, and that's Marguerite Higgins for the New York Tribune. There were six women, sorry, six individuals who won for Korea, for their reporting from Korea. She was the only woman around uh, among about 300 men correspondents. And uh, when you read the legends, you know, hers even though she was extraordinarily brave and pushed her colleagues to do things, take risks they would never have taken. Um, hers reads like, well, you know, it was really hard for a girl. That, that's kind of the feeling you get where the other reporters have a different legend, kind of interesting. And then of course, there's still few prizes up until the seventies, but I think Frances Fitzgerald's work from Vietnam is important to note because not only did she win the Pulitzer, she won the National Book Award and the Bancroft Prize for her uh, reporting from Vietnam. And uh, that's especially interesting because it's the same year that David Halberstam's book came out. And yet this 20 something um, really ran away with the store. So I thought that was important to mention. And then I um, let's move on. I, I looked at you know careers that that lasted a long time, women who did really exceptional things like Anne Stringer, who's someone you'll never hear of, but uh, there's a small chapter book coming out about her that's really excerpted from the book from Thorn Willow Press <clears throat> for next month as Women's History Celebration. But Margaret Martha Gellhorn, whose career lasted 50 years, or someone you've never heard of, Evan Asbury of the New York Times, who also had a lengthy, lengthy career. In Edith Evans Asbury's case, she doesn't really hit stride till her 40s. And this is true of quite a few women. It's true of Ethel Payne. It's true of Alice Dunnigan. It's true of, um, of, uh, of, of women in television who don't hit stride till their 40s. Someone suggested to me that a reason for that, I don't know if this is true, but has to do with less sexuality in the newsroom, that women of a certain age felt like less of a disruption. There's a period in the 20s where editors talk often about women crossing their legs on desks and flirting with copy boys and doing things that turn out to be a great distraction. Uh, whether that's the reason or not, I can't tell you, but I thought it was interesting. Um, then, uh, so those careers seemed important to me and I was interested in where age helped and hurt. I devoted space to the couples phenomenon over decades. A lot of these women were helped by partners. That happens uh, often. There's a great chapter from the 1980s about women who were not helped by being partners when their husbands were succeeding at another publication. And that publication insisted that the husband take precedence. That's kind of an interesting point in the book. Um, the book has a lot of implied career counseling and cautionary tales. And I gave space to how and why the most successful women made their way when it was not easy to do so. And I spent a lot of time on those who failed. Um, I looked at the evolution of women's work off the women's pages and how that figured in women's advancement. 
And I looked at the particular struggles of women in broadcast media, especially in terms of age, race, aesthetics. Um, there are some fantastic figures uh, among the Black community that I want to mention besides Marianne Shad Carey and Ida B. Wells, Gertrude Mosel, who was a physician's wife from Philadelphia, who very early on in the 1880s was able to cross over. She could write for the mainstream press as well as for the black press. The story of Melba Tolliver is extraordinary. Uh, the way she comes into television, the figure she becomes in New York local television, which of course is not a small market. And then the story of what happens when she decides to wear her hair naturally and wants to wear it to a White House wedding during the Nixon administration, and how she is slammed um, by her producers, told, and all of her uh, footage is cut out. And yet, uh, somebody leaks it to the press, and so she has no further reper repercussions from that, but her career really catapults, which is amazing. Uh, Carol Simpson, of course, is a great character and a great figure and one of the first uh, anchors who was Black. But more interestingly, she ran um, a women's dispute that they had prepared and uh, offered during a celebration of Barbara Walters. And Rune Arledge, Ar Arledge sat and listened and then took action because her husband was a computer expert of some sort. And so they had a real data-driven approach to explaining how women were being exploited. Pretty remarkable. And then Charlene Hunter-Galt is one of my favorite figures. And um, she just has had a remarkable career. Um, at the New York Times, she started the first Harlem Bureau, um, which was a hyper-local bureau before there was hyper-local in the 1960s. She's the one who got the paper to stop using uh, Negro and to use the word black instead and left a good name everywhere she went, um, you know, despite whatever she put up with and made her own choices about her career moves and found that public television gave her the opportunity to go more deeply into stories she wanted to cover. I love talking to her. Um, so what else can I tell you? Um, I was particularly struck by a couple of things that building this long continuum made clear. Going, you know, I've done a lot of work in this, in various parts of this area, as Tracy, you'll hear, has done also. But doing it decade by decade in a straight line was so particular. So when I was at NYU during those 22 years, we did three of these compilations, working with editors and producers, top top names across the field. In 1999, we produced a list of the 100 most outstanding works of journalism of the 20th century. And as I went to count, knowing the difficulties women had up until really the mid 1990s and even you know long thereafter, we would still say that 16 of the 100 pieces were by women when you consider that women only really had standing for a very small part of that period uh, is remarkable. And we did it again uh, for the first decade of the uh, 2000 to 2009 period. And in that, at that point, 40% of the people in the field were women. This had slowly built from 10% in the, in the very early years up to 40 four by 10 were by women. So that's commensurate with the number of women in the field, pretty good. And then in the last round, 2010 to 2019, interestingly, seven of the 10 were by women and four of those were women of color. So um, you can make your own evaluation of what that means, but I think that's pretty cool. I was also struck by the fact that at the 50th anniversaries of Joan Didion's Slouching Towards Bethlehem, Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, Hannah Arendt's Eichmann in Jerusalem, and even Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique. And I think, you know, it's pretty much a work of journalism in many ways as well, that there were commemorations, conferences, exhibitions. And this is journalism, which is meant to disappear. It's not meant to last. So when that is happening to your work, and I try to think of the men whose work we celebrate at 50 years, the men who are journalists, um, the women stand pretty well. 
So I'll stop with that and um, invite Tracy to come talk to me. Hi, Tracy. Hi. Well, first, thank you so much for writing this book. It's delightful. It's readable. Um, and what I love about it is by taking such a long view, we really get to see how so many of these themes um, that we see even today in women's journalistic careers have deep, deep roots going back to the 19th century. Um, so one of those themes that I wonder if you can unpack a little bit is a framing of women's work that you alluded to when you were talking about Mary Clummer. And it's this how a woman sees it <laughs> frame, right? Um, because as you show in your book, that comes up again and again and again in the decades to come. Some some women journalists lean into this and 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 make themselves and their gender part of the story. Others do not do that. But even if women didn't make their gender part of the story, often their newspapers went ahead and did that for them, right? Um, can you tell us a little more about, about that framing? How did it help and how did it hurt? So it helped and hurt. You're absolutely right. It helped in the sense that women found a shoot through which they could slide into mainstream journalism. Women, for the most part, except for the real exceptions like Margaret Fuller, and others we've spoken about, the way in was gossip, sidewalk gossip, society news, flower shows, rubber raincoats. I mean, this is what, this was women's fair. And they were as bored by it as many of us might be. So how do you get out of that? Well, why was that even happening? Because it was remunerative, because it generated ads. It generated revenue for the paper, which also created place for women, for women. So as a woman saw it is one of those frames. Another one was the stunt girls, Nellie Bly. I was there, you can believe me. I'm a risk taker with my you know, tiny wasp waist and million dollar smile. Um, there was that. That works until it tires out. Well, then it's not a revenue producer anymore, so it goes away. What's the next wave? The Sob Sisters, like Mary Sunshine in the play Chicago, which incidentally was written by a woman who at the Chicago Tribune was covering crime, uh, women's crime. So, you know, where obviously where the ideas come from. That's another thing that works for a little while. Then we get the next wave, which is the front page girl. This is the closest women come to really doing general assignment, real hardcore work. So each of those frames does exactly the same thing. It creates opportunity and maybe one or two women are gonna jump out of that and become more and become women doing jobs men would envy, which is the women I'm talking about, or not. Uh, so yes. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's interesting too to hear you say it creates opportunities for one or two women. It's not creating opportunities for a whole bunch of women, right? As long as you are making gender the consideration, you've delimited prospects. You just right. have. Right. Um, so continuing with this and i'm we're getting lots of excellent questions um in the chat and um from some folks in advance as well um somebody wanted to know about the use of pen names oh so and, yeah so, so can we talk about that sure. some yes and some no i think is the answer uh it was considered unseemly for a woman to have her name in the paper any time except birth marriage and death uh, but some women just eschewed that and went ahead and used their own names. So both happened and both were happening from the beginning. And mm -hmm. they often, if they used a pen name, it was often alliterative, Fanny Fern, Nellie Bly, Holly Pry, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, I'll jump in and add too that another necessarily. Uh, device that women used was using their initials. So okay. Sylvia Porter did that um, in financial journalism when she started writing uh, during the Depression, she hid her gender behind the byline S.F. Porter oh, until her editor at the New York Post decided in 1942 that it would actually sell more papers to um, have her come out as a woman. So that's when she became um, Sylvia Porter and was really glamorized. And, um, you know, it, it, it fed the as a woman sees it frame, as as you described. 
I always liked being Brooke Kroger because it was so uh, ambiguous. I, I liked that. I mean, I, I used it. Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, that's true. Margaret Fuller used F at the, at the dial. She would use just the initial F. But when she gets to the Tribune, she uses the asterisk, just an asterisk. I think she understood herself to be a star. Yeah, and you bring that back in. Um, that asterisk comes back in in your epilogue, which is um, a really nice full circle moment. I have to tell you, I couldn't find an ending. And I was speaking to uh, one of the publishers of the 19th. And she's explaining that the asterisk is part of the name because it's supposed to add all the people you know, beyond just the binary. And I said, but do you know that it's Margaret Fuller's signature? Thank you for that. You know, so it's a good moment. Yes, absolutely. Um, so somebody wanted to know who has been your inspiration personally and professionally? Oh gosh, well, early on at age nine, it was Nellie Bly reading that childhood biography. And I know I am not alone in this. Uh, many women journalists will chart their beginnings to saying, oh my goodness, I could do that. What an exciting, worthwhile life. So I have to say Nellie Bly because I have to. And then later on, you know, Joan Didion. I mean, there's just so many people who uh, inspire me uh, so much. Um, yeah. 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 Um, in the chat, Ashley Walter wants to know, Brooke, <laughs> what was something you had to cut from the book, but wish you could have kept in? Well, the reason there are 120 pages of endnotes and the book itself, the text is really only 398 pages, although it looks, you know, like a doorstop. It was the trouble I had with cutting material was, you know, turning it all into endnotes, which is a lot of what I did. And then there are just so many people who have fantastic stories. And I know that readers will say, where is so-and-so and why not so-and-so? And that I had to make those hard choices to keep the book at a readable length. And so one of the reasons, one of the ways of approaching that was if I had told a story already that had the contours of someone else's story, it didn't make sense to tell it again because the book is meant to be representative. Or I know that a later story was going to tell it, so I didn't tell it earlier. Uh, th those would be ways of making those very hard choices. Yeah. Um, we've had a couple questions um, about the period between the 1870s through the 1890s. Lisa Butler would like to know what happened uh, in the 1880s that caused women's pay to decrease relative to men's. So I can only speculate about that, but it definitely happened. And editors talk about the fact that it happened and that it would soon go away, which of course it has never gone away. As we know, women are today still paid some percentage less than men. I, I can only speculate, but I would say the obvious reason is women wanted this work in order to have it the editors figured out that they would work for less happily. There was a large understanding that stands until the 1970s or 1980s that men need to make a living to support families and women don't. Of course, there were plenty of women supporting their mothers, their sisters, their children, but that was not considered. It was considered men as breadwinners needed to earn more. So that was one of the big reasons. But earlier, I think when the field was young, you know, you paid for the work, so the work was the work, but there were so few women involved at that point that uh, there probably wasn't the feeling that you needed to make a, a, a distinction. And yet later when there were many, you know, cause we go from 10% to 15 to 20, it, it starts growing by the 1880s. It's a pretty big compliment that um, women would work for less and often didn't ask for raises. We know about that problem too. Mm -hmm. And um, a theme that that comes up in your book frequently, too, is um, the use of women as freelancers rather than putting them on salary. Correct. Piecework. Piecework, yeah. which they were used to doing. And some you know, may have favored that because they had other obligations. Women's fear didn't go away just because women ventured outside the household, as we know. So mm -hmm. 
that would be another reason you might accept those conditions simply for the joy of doing the work mm -hmm. because the work is not drudgery and a lot of work available to women was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, somebody else also wanted to know about um, Ida B. Wells. So when her press is destroyed, when she's run out of Memphis, um, the question is, um, was that covered in the media? And if so, how? And I I assume by this, we mean, did the um, was this covered in the white newspapers of the time? Uh, I, I'm i sure it was. I mean, I'm sure it, in, in Tennessee, it was news. I mean, no doubt. I think the news comes from her writing this 6,000 word opus and which really establishes her as a national figure. She was already considered the princess of the black press. I mean, she already was, ha had that reputation from earlier days. She'd been an educator and then moved into news work. Uh, and then, you know, she kind of segues out of journalism into activism. She works on the suffrage movement. She works on civil rights. She marries, moves to Chicago and, and really becomes a national figure, an international figure, in fact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I wonder if we can move forward into the 20th century. OK, um, you 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 have mentioned cautionary tales. You've, um, what I want to know is um, specifically about women in leadership roles. So the second wave feminist movement of the 1960s and 70s led to um, anti-discrimination lawsuits that, um, that you cover in your book. Um, and you, you know, eventually led to a push to get more women, not just um, on the staff, but also into leadership roles where the theory went, they could make decisions about how the news got covered. They could create maybe some more systemic changes, right? Um, but that, but it wasn't easy, right? It wasn't an easy period. And I think it does raise the question of how, you know, how, how much change was there really? And What's your well, what was your takeaway from that period and and the women that you wrote about with regard to their leadership experiences? So one thing we notice that women were tracked into features. If they were on a leadership track, they start in features. Margaret Sullivan started in features. Uh, Carol Sutton started in on the women's pages, either women's pages or features. Mm -hmm. uh, Marianne Dolan features. So. To move from features into high editorial position was not easy uh, because the, the normal track would be from the city editor track. And women almost never had those jobs, though I do mention a few who had them even in the 1930s. You know, we never can say never because there's always somebody. I mean, you always find out that there's somebody and somebody earlier. So that's why I get worked up about trailblazers because most people are just not. They, you know, they may be suffering the same <laughs> misery, but they're they're not blazing the trail in any event. Uh, so that that's one one consideration that they're not being tracked to get there. When women finally get assistant managing editor positions at the New York Times, which takes you know twenty years longer than anywhere else, I asked both of them, who are both among us, did you consider yourself? a possibility to be editor in chief. And one said, it never entered my mind. And in fact, speaking to people in charge at the time, it never entered their mind either. And the other one had diabetes and children at home and a husband who was unable to help very much. So it was not on her scope either. So the people who got promoted into a position, AME is one from which you really could advance, were not under consideration. So that tells you who was being chosen to do the work. They're both fantastic editors, wonderful human beings, easy to get along with. Um, those could be qualities. In other cases, there were men who really were interested in promoting women. That often happens at papers that were failing. Women are often advancing when the publication is failing. So it's like the Hail Mary pass, you know, I'll try anything. And why not use the best talent I've got, regardless of gender? 
That's Marianne Dolan's story uh, going to the L.A. Herald Examiner, which was on its you know final legs, not quite there, but almost. And um, and then she finally prevails as editor coming through features, you know, bypassing the city desk. And she was a great editor. So that happens. Great editor at the Miami Herald who got ill and, you know, died very quickly. So we don't know that whole story. And Carol Sutton was underprepared. You know, she was put into a position without support from above that she needed and without proper preparation to do the position. So, you know, that happens. And then, of course, more recently, we know, you know, Jill Abrams' story at the Times, et cetera. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And sp speaking about those um, those actions, the lawsuits at Newsweek and the Times and these major news organizations, um, I thought it was really interesting um, how you noted who was and wasn't part of of some of that activity, right? We know at the New York Times, Charlotte Curtis and Ada Louise Huxtable um, chose not to join the women. Correct. And those were the women who could have helped the most, of course. They were the biggest shots. Um, they had their own fiefdoms. They were exceptional. They really did run shows, uh, but decided not to help because they were corporate. They you know, understood that. The black women did not join the suit at the times. Uh, they were running their own and uh, felt that their identification as black women was much more important. Um, that was an interesting uh, interlude for me because in talking with Charlene Hunter Galt, she told me, well, I knew about a story that she had done in Harlem about the youngest heroin addict at the time who had died that she had found and the Times sent Joe Lelyveld, who recently passed away, a fantastic editor, but was a young reporter at the time, like she was, up to Harlem to work with her on the story. And it was it won a publisher's award. It won a newspaper award. But at the time, the Times had a one byline policy. So Joe Lelyveld signed the story. Um, so I asked her how she felt about that. And it had won a publisher. I mean, she had gotten her acknowledgment, but in the press organization that gave the award, it went to Joe. And um, so I asked her how she felt about that. And she said, I was fine with that. It was a great assignment. I made great contacts and I loved working with Joe. It was good. And she says, you know, and we were talking about other things. And she said, you know, being a black woman and a journalist, you know, sometimes it's a challenge, you know, like that. And so my editor questioned it. I mean, to me, it made sense. I understood. What, I thought I understood what she was saying. And so in the edit, he says, you have to develop this. This is facile. You have to say more, you know, like, OK. Uh, so I wrote to her. She didn't write back. So I didn't press it. I felt, you know, that was inappropriate. And then I start questioning all my everyone, you know, to tell me more about this. And no one will say a word. All people will say is, I would never deign to speak for Charlene Hunter Galt. You know, she's sacrosanct. I would never do that. And I said, Well, I'm not asking you to speak for her. I'm asking you to speak for yourself. Tell me, tell me more about what this might mean. And um, and the answer was that came from several quarters. Um, as a black woman and a journalist, you cannot raise questions like that. That mm -hmm. it's career killer. You cannot do that. And that, you know, was recent. That was recent, not uh, a 1990s conversation or 1980s or 1970s or 1960s. So that was um, sobering to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a question about uh, the current percentage of um, men versus women in journalism. Um, you know, particularly given the makeup. I'm not sure um, everybody realizes this, but in our journalism classes, they are um, at least two thirds women, oh, right? I think that's been true for a long time, mm -hmm. long time, even three quarters. But in the field, I think it's like law and accounting and other fields such as that, that the schools are full. And then when you get to leadership, partnership, all those sorts of roles, women fall off. That's right. Um, that's right. 
Okay. I know that our time is getting a little bit short um, and I want to make sure that I, um, you know, have hit on um, as many of these questions coming in as, as possible. So somebody who wrote in advance wanted to know about, um, historically speaking, if women were, were big readers of the newspaper. Um, and I wonder if, yeah, if you can talk a little bit about the relationship between these women and women readers. Um, well, you know, I, I don't have any figures, but these women were interested in the world. They were interested in politics. They wrote about politics. You would have to be a reader. You'd have to be up on the news to know these things. Remember also the newspapers were like four pages long. So it wasn't hard. To, it wasn't so hard to be at least up until the 1880s when we get these big Sunday papers. But, you know, a paper was what, 16 pages. I mean, it was very digestible. Uh, so I think, yes, of course, they were readers. I mean, you, you couldn't be doing that. You couldn't be doing work at the level of which I'm talking about. You probably could write about flower shows, you know, and not be a serious reader. But I think anybody who aspired to leadership, an Anne McCormick, you know, a Martha Gellhorn, they are readers. Of course they are. There's there are no writers that aren't readers. Wouldn't right. you say? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and women that I, I interviewed who worked in television in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, um, they talked about their women viewers and just how much support they got from oh, wow. their their women viewers. And I I have to believe that that it was the same for women um, in print. There was one question uh, that came in earlier that I didn't address about uh, if women fr who do television and who do heart, you know, print news were the same, magazines, whatever, are the same. And the answer is yes and no. Um, I know women who have obviously morphed from print into broadcast. Uh, not so many who've gone the other direction, I would say, but I think that that is a path. And I think that was a very bad path because they would come with wire service training or some hardcore new skills that in addition to appearance and voice and all the other things that matter and writing skills, you know, would be uh, appreciated. Mm -hmm. Margaret, do you want us to shut up? I know. I we're just this just has been so fascinating. And we really thank you both. We learned a tremendous amount. Um, and we appreciate your insight gained both from your research and from your hands-on experience as reporters, um, both of you. We are really grateful for your work and then also for your capacity to step back and tell us um how it goes behind the scenes and the impact on all of us. So thank you so much. And as we do for all our authors in the American Inspiration series, we've asked Brooke to do a final reading um, from her book, and then we'll come back with a bit of wrap up. But um, Tracy, thank you. And Brooke, over to you. Thank you. This is the conclusion of the book. In fact, women at the top of the field have influenced journalism's every aspect, including the widening and diversifying of its topics, which increased revenue, the early development of investigative reporting, the more inclusive scope of coverage more generally, the development of the interview as a key journalistic form, and most recently, the modeling of employee benefits that come closer than ever before to meeting the needs of the people who do the work. Women of all descriptions have faced down and overcome all manner of impediment to become integral to this enterprise, including the barriers in thought and action they allowed to stand too long and those they created or perpetuated themselves. Through their example, their collective and personal effort, their performance, their breakthroughs, and the changes their presence and engagement have brought, women have proved essential to this vital, imperiled profession and to the never finished effort to keep making it better. Thank you, Brooke, for that rallying cry that we need to keep working to make media coverage in this country even better. And thanks also for reminding us of the advances women have made for readers, for the industry, for all people, including men and families. This is progress 
thankfully. And it's a really important message in history, Women's History Month. So we are really grateful to be hearing that, particularly in this month. Back to tonight, Kristen and I want to thank especially our guest author, Brooke Kroger, who joined us from New York City, and Tracy Luke, who is heading right now immediately to teach her journalism seminar at Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa. Many thanks to her students for joining us and also to the group assembled at Fox Hill Village in Westwood, Massachusetts. GBH Forum Network, we truly appreciate your work. And to all the audience out there in Zoomland, thank you for your interest in America's history in all of its diversity, particularly in Women's History Month. We hope to see you soon again. And for now, a good night to all of you.